Thank you for joining today's uh, webinar. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, webinar organized by GRSS React. Uh, as you know, um, React is relatively new, a relatively new technical committee uh, under GRSS, uh, co-chaired by Irena Heinzig, who's here with us. Yeah, hi, Irena. And um, in today's webinar, um, our guest speaker is Dr. Jakob Steiner. Uh, we are grateful to him uh, that he gave us his time. Uh, before we move on formally, uh, just a little quick introduction about React. Uh, so React is basically, as I already said, a relatively new technical committee. Its, its focus is basically on the remote sensing technologies and methods and analyses that are focused more towards climate change uh, and related issues. And within React, or one may say under the React's umbrella, we have multiple uh, working groups or the so-called local focus areas. Uh, we are following a bottom-up approach where we have actually uh, several different application areas under focus such as the cryosphere changes and hazards happening in the Hindu Kush Himalayas. That's one domain. Another one is the uh, agricultural monitoring. Then we have food security as another subject, Pacific islands and so on. Today's webinar is more centered around the cryosphere issues in the HKH. And within, within that context, Dr. Jakub has worked a lot and uh, he has a very wide experience in in risk management in high mountain Asia. Uh, he has been part of uh, the uh, several fieldwork teams that, that have done expeditions in these regions. And currently he's based in Pakistan. He has worked for EC mode as well. Um, he, he's an expert in the domain and uh, I would actually rather invite him to take the floor and uh, introduce himself more directly. Uh, so over to you, Jakub. Thank you, Adnan, um, for the introduction. Well, thanks to all of you for inviting me to speak today um, and welcome on my behalf as well. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Jakob Steiner, like Adnan said. Uh, I'm originally from, from Austria. I will give you a brief introduction into my professional background in a second. But like Adnan also said, I'm, I'm based in, in Pakistan and I've been working in high mountain Asia for the last, I'm getting old, the last 20, nearly 20 years now. Um, so today I, I want to talk to you about, um, yeah, rem I mean, remote sensing, of course, this is uh, you know, for, for the community of interest and how that is um, how that is used in risk management in high mountain Asia. Cryosphere is definitely a strong focus. Um, I, will, I will talk about remote sensing products as well, but my focus is not going to be so much about you know, specific um, technical approaches or specific products. I think those you know very well. Um, my motivation here is really to show you a bit uh, my experience with um, the capacities around and how these, how the data that is available um, from different satellites, from different platforms is actually being used in um, in responses. Right? Um, and that's also the, 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 the title page that you can see here. Normally in my presentations, I always have nice pictures from my field work where you see high mountains in the background, but this is a very, very messy um, uh, cover page because the process that we that we work in is often quite messy. This is a, you know, SRTM in the background. It has a CubeSat image of a, of a, um, um, of, of a mountain, of a part of the Hindu Kush in um, overlaid on top of that. And then on top of that, again, is a uh, difference map between two sentinel images um, mapping uh, a debris flow that happened coming out of this lake and has damaged uh, quite substantial hydropower infrastructure. And we produced this. So I produced this really you know, very briefly after an event has happened because we needed to provide this to stakeholders. Um, so it's a massive process, and I want to talk about these, you know, the, the capacities behind these processes in the region, and I think what, you know, what the horizons can, what the potential is in the region in future. Now, my affiliation is uh, with the University of Graz. I'm a postdoc fellow in, in, in Austria, um, but I'm also a fellow at the Himalayan University Consortium, which is uh, just the label that you see at the bottom. So that's the, the network of universities. Um, in high mountain Asia, spanning from Afghanistan all the way to Bangladesh, um, Myanmar, and also including universities outside of them. 
we're doing a lot of coordination in the academic field. Um, very briefly, my background, I did my, my, my master's in environmental engineering at PTIH in Zurich. This is also how I got to know Adnan originally and how I know Serena as well, because he was actually one of my professors when I was still a bachelor student. Um, I then did my PhD in physical geography in the Netherlands in the, at the Universiteit of Utrecht. Um, and I subsequently uh, joined ISIMOD. I was the Chrysler group lead there until 2022. Um, and now, as I said, I'm a postdoc in Graz and um, at the HUC. The dots that you can see on the world map that I projected here, well, the world map is all the, all the mountain areas. This suggests that I'm working in mountains. Um, I also work in Greenland, but I'm not going to talk about that. Today. So I'm really going to focus on high mountain Asia, which um, is most of my professional experience actually lies. Um, just very briefly, the definition of high mountain Asia is not always so straightforward, but it really spans from all the way in Central Asia um, in, uh, in, in, in the West to the Hengduan Shan, so to, uh, to, to Myanmar, uh, the upper reaches of the Mekong and the South in the East. Um, so vast expense, that also means a vast expense of cutting across many different countries, cutting across many different, you know, um, forms of government, forms of governance, uh, resources, uh, cultures, languages, which makes working in the region interesting, but also challenging, especially when it comes to addressing risks, especially, of course, in this very, very changing, fast changing, uh, you know, uh, uh, landscape of, uh, of climate change as well. Now, I want to introduce to you how I, you know, how how I got to make the link to write to to remote sensing as well with with a story of a paper that we wrote a couple of years back when I was still a PhD student in the Netherlands, and we looked at the specific glacier in high, in, in the, the Karakorum, which is searching. So this is the, the the animation that you see on the right here. So basically, a glacier that very very quickly moves forward. We used CubeSat satellites, which were still pretty young at that point, right, from planet to visualize that change and also to quantify that very high speed, that velocity up to 20 meters per day of the glacier. Um, and we could, you know, we packaged that into <clears throat> a scientific paper, which I'm not going to go into detail here, but um, this was a bit also to show the potential of this, you know, the, of the, the landscape of, of, of satellites flying around uh, constantly. Um, and while writing that paper, we already interact very closely with local authorities, with people in in these localities, um, and we're thinking about okay, how to make that actually useful on the ground. And at the same time, of course, also you know how to communicate outside. While I was checking the old Landsat images um, to trace the history of that glacier, I was lucky enough to get one Landsat image where actually a huge avalanche um, dropped down on that glacier. So you see the powder avalanche on the Landsat frame here. Um, which was a very lucky instance because that happens very rarely that in an area where otherwise there's not a single uh, avalanche, it really came down at that exact moment when the overpass came. And um, the, uh, so NASA itself, they just did a story on basically that one image. They didn't care so much about my paper. They cared about this photo because, of course, it also showed the power of Lanza. Um, and we are working on avalanches as well by now in terms of science, mapping them, quantifying their impact. Um, but of course, this communication and showing the, the power of remote sensing is also very important while we do the science and while we communicate with stakeholders. Now, so so that's how you know how we got more involved with using remote sensing um, data, high, high resolution remote sensing data, and different types of products, elevation models, um, high resolution images, um, and pairing them with modeling approaches and making them available for local stakeholders. In this case, in the Karakoro, but it could be anywhere in the mountain area. Now, this what this has led me to over the years was getting involved very much with A, the risks, of course. So this is what I want to talk about today. Right? So we have a, a number of risks that we are dealing with in the area. Um, so A, these are the fast events, like what you saw in Avalanche, for example, but also slow onset events, uh, droughts, subsidence, everything that is very interesting for remote sensing as well. We have increasing exposure. Again, remote sensing is very important for them. For that, right? So we have more and more um, infrastructure being developed in mountainous areas, and we have perhaps increasing or sometimes decreasing vulnerabilities, which is much much more difficult to quantify or to map. Now there are the resources. As I said, I'm not going to focus so much on that because we all know the different products that are around. Right? So there is in situ monitoring, which is actually where I come from. So I did my masters and my PhD in 
mountain hydrology. I put up weather stations. I service, so I go a lot to the field. I service weather stations. Um, but so the, there are those resources from on site, and then the remote sensing resources that we pair this with. Um, and both of them are developing very, very fast. Uh, and then finally, there are the capacities, right? So we have the academic capacities here and and elsewhere, and we have government capacities. Both of them are crucial for addressing risks. Um, how they work together is is the question, and is something that that we have to deal with a lot. Right? How do we make the output, for example, from academia useful for those who actually call the thoughts? Now, the next level then is okay. Uh, what are the specific challenges for high mountain Asia, right? Uh, why is this so interesting in high mountain Asia? What makes this different from anywhere else? Now, when we talk about the risks, here everything is bigger, higher, steeper. Like I come from the Alps. Mountains are pretty high in the Alps, but let's face it, they are a bit higher here. Um, the differences in elevation when I stand in front of one of the peaks doing my field work, you know, I sometimes look up mountain walls, head walls that are 2,000 meters high. Um, that very rarely happens in the Alps. Uh, that also has an impact on, on, on many of the hazards happening, right? Um, climate is also a bit more extreme. You have monsoon uh, that, that are mixed with very dry uh, regions. We do see faster changes um, of uh, climate change to some degree with so what we refer to as elevation dependent climate change. So as the higher we go, some changes are happening fast. And then, of course, we have a challenge in access. The topography is so extreme that also access becomes hard. Um, in terms of resources, uh, in mountains, resolution and the quality of remote sensing becomes a different challenge. Um, because some of the products that we rely on are less suitable in these very heterogeneous environments that mountains are. Uh, because they don't resolve some of the challenges that we see in these small valleys. And you have problems with radar data because of shading and all kinds of issues. So some of the issues become much harder in mountain. Um, and the, there is the, the, that challenge of documentation and of data sharing in, in mountain areas, not because they are mountains, but because often they lie on border areas. So mountains, just like in the Alps, uh, just in, in high mountain Asia, are often also the national borders between countries. So we have to deal with the same challenge across two different nations, different ways of governance, two different academic bodies. And and and, and aligning that is, is, is hard. In terms of capacities, there is the challenge of you know penetrating mountain regions. People who also in Pakistan, Adnan knows this very well. Um, you know, a, a, a Pakistani per se may not be uh suitable to, to to say anything about mountains in Pakistan, like uh, an Austrian where I come from, maybe like I come from the mountainous part of Austria and we are very proud about the fact that the people in Vienna, in our capital, don't know enough about the mountains because they're very far away. Now, in, 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 in many high mountain Asian countries, also the universities and the government bodies, they don't sit in the mountains, they sit far away from them. So, so, so the people who are affected and the people who know most about mountains may not necessarily be those who who are driving um, capacities in often the lower parts of the country. And then finally, I'm interested in, okay, how is this, um, you know, uh, how is this, uh, how is this going to change in future? We have an increasing coverage of, um, of our understanding of how risks are developing in these regions, right? So for what we, we look here, maybe there, there may be an increase of frequency and intensity for many hazards. We are not sure yet, but we are suspecting that often with climate change. And definitely there's going to be a change of exposure. So there's rapid change in risks in the region. Now, in terms of resources, very exciting. There are so many new remote sensing products, for, for example, as well, that sometimes we, you know, even for us professionals, it's hard to deal with all that, right? There's kind of a data overflow. And, and even harder it is for the government agencies who, who have to respond to how best address some of the risks in the region. How should they deal with this? Uh, you know, every every year a new satellite with new technology being shot into space. Um, so keeping up with um, with this technological development is is a challenge. And with many of the big events, it's looking for the needle in the haystack. Right? They don't happen at a large scale like big floods. An avalanche just happens on one spot. And anticipating where it's going to happen next, um, we have a big challenge with glacial lake outburst floods. Which one is going to breach next is really really hard. 
And finally, on, on the capacity side, the horizon, this is actually what I find personally most interesting, but also most difficult is in many of the countries in the region, there is huge growth of capacities in terms of quantity and in quality. Um, but in many countries with an economic challenge, and an academic challenge for universities to kind of, you know, um, to provide opportunities for people coming up in universities, uh, perhaps they don't want to stay. Um, perhaps they don't have the right opportunities in this professional environment. So, um, or there is a glass ceiling, which in terms of, you know, the, the, the new generation, which understands all these new remote sensing products, are they the ones who are going to call the shots uh, in, in near future? Um, or, are, or are they not? And they get frustrated. So this is a bit that, that um, uh, the experience that I want to share as well, because I think that's, that's a big challenge also when we talk about new technology. Um, we, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still relatively early in my career, but I already see that some of the technology I'm not going to learn so much anymore. I rather prefer to work with uh, younger students who are super excited, excited about the new technology and let them lead. Um, but they can only lead if they actually get the chance to. Uh, and that's that's a big challenge in universities in general, I think, but um, here in the region especially. And then this is all the frame this all leads to is is a topic that I'm you know we're not going to deal so much with here, but in, in the end is you know how do we how do we govern risks in, in climate change in, in the region right the, the, the governance of risks um, and in, in the mountains specifically as well and and the data that we have to to do effective governance of those of those risks um, or governance in these regions is is a crucial aspect. And I think that's also why it's important that you, so the community that is dealing with remote sensing, is in close exchange with those who are more on the policy side, for example, or who are more on the side of rapid response in the field um, to, to make sure that these new capacities are, are being used adequately and we know we can anticipate what the developments are going to be in the future. Um, I'm going to start with the risks. That's kind of the the easiest, right, the most natural. So talk about some of the, the processes that we are most interested in in the region or that, that I've been working with. There, there's a whole plethora of, of different processes that we cannot all deal with today. Um, but I, I want to give you some of the examples that we are we are looking into. Um, this is a, a an overview figure that we made for one of the big assessment reports that was published last year. Um, it's the, called the High Vice Report, uh, published by ECMOD. Um, and just gives you an overview of one of the so a number of the big um, hazard events uh, that that have caused considerable impact in the region in the last um, the last ten years or so. Uh, so so the, the all the, these dots here you can see in blue are glacial lake outburst floods in yellow these glacial detachments. Which is a relatively new topic. There's a lot of interest as well when whole glaciers um, start to run away. Ice avalanches, a huge topic as well. Um, the, the blue triangles, and then we have rock slides, of course, and, and snow avalanches. Um, and then a couple of numbers here in terms of fatalities. Uh, the numbers of people who die each year in high mountain Asia because of these hazards is, is very, very high, but often we simply don't know yet. Um, so the, the counting and even you know getting the data right is still a challenge. We are, with remote sensing, interested in both um, types of of hazard chains. Um, the fast onset ones, as I said, they're it's a bit more difficult to catch them in time, um, but often they are more in your face. Um, so a glacial lake outburst floods, in immediately everyone realizes what is happening, but then it's often already too late, right? When the whole lake reaches and drains. Um, and then there are the slow onset events, something that, for example, in Afghanistan is a huge issue all over the high mountain Asia we had this year as well, there was very little snowfall in winter. And then we are scared of having too little water for irrigation in subsequent spring, right? Um, which has a huge economic impact and huge impact on livelihoods, where there is you know, there's a lot of research on glaciers, but still not enough research really on changing snow in the region. Um, land subsidence, for those of you who, who are from, or even from India, who have professional experience in, in northern India and in Uttarakhand, this has been a huge issue, issue in the Joshimat region where whole villages basically have started to slide away because of subsidence. And, and something that we are quite interested in is permafrost thaw. So as, as permafrost is thawing all over high mountain Asia, we see a lot of land moving quite slowly. 
um, but we are suspecting that is moving up and, and that is problematic for a number of reasons, ecological reasons, but in terms of mass movement. Um, for all those issues, we are we are trying to, to make uh, remote sensing uh, work and integrate that with uh, with solutions. Now, the biggest issue, as I've already uh, um, mentioned, so I'm, I'm looking here at the fast onset events, which is a bit more where I've been working on. Um, for for some of them, we don't even know, so so it's not properly counted how much they, you know, what their impacts are. So I, I put here a couple of um, um, types of, of hazards together in the region: landslides, glacial lake outburst floods, snow avalanches, um, or snow and ice avalanches. The brief lows, a huge topic that hasn't seen enough research really in the region. Glacier detachments and rock ice avalanches, and you can see so some of those like landslides, they happen very often. Frequency is very high. He also caused by far the highest number of um, fatalities. Um, and there has been, uh, in terms of trends, we are never quite sure. This is very hard to say, but in terms of research, there has been a lot of investment in terms of understanding frequency and, and patterns of landslides in the region. The same is true for glacial lake outburst floods. They get a lot of attention in high mountain Asia. I often say too much because actually they happen relatively rarely and have less impacts than some of the other hazards we are focusing not enough on. Um, so this doesn't say we should do more research on them. We should, but um, they, 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 the, the, there is a bit of a disproportionate focus on this one hazard because they, they are so extreme. If you have this imagination of a lake draining, and it's also relatively easy to catch that on, on imagery compared to some of the other hazards. Um, but so, so they have re, uh, um, received some um, quite some attention in Greece. Avalanches, for example, that happen a lot more often, um, there is a lot less research on that. It's also much, much harder to spot them on remote sensing imagery, right? So this is where radar, for example, comes in. And I think where there is a, a, a lot of interest in whatever is produced, being produced in the radar world uh, for, for high mountain Asia to get a better understanding of what is actually happening to avalanches in the region. Um, because we see from all the stakeholders that we work with, be it in Nepal, be it in Pakistan or Afghanistan, when you talk to also locals, they are very, very, very concerned about avalanches. It impacts their livelihoods. It impacts, sometimes it doesn't kill people, but it kills swaths of yak herds, of goat herds. It destroys livelihoods of a family within a few hours. Happens much more often, like I said, like some other um, hazards. So it's really, it's a big issue in the region. So there is, there is a big need to invest more in the topic. And I think the same is true for debris flows, where you can see there's a lot unknown. We don't have proper databases on on, on how many people were even killed in these, these kind of events. There's a lot of um, impact, process understanding, but in terms of counting where they happen, we don't know so much about. And then these much more less frequent, um, very peculiar events are glacier detachments and rock ice avalanches, where actually a lot of Swiss researchers have, um, have focused on in the past. Um, I want to give you an example of one of the hazards that, that are even harder to track just to, to tell you some of the hazards we don't even realize yet that they're coming up and they may already be, you know, they may have already started to occur. And we kind of should try to be ahead of the curve with our data on how to anticipate them and how to be prepared for them in future. Now, we have this, like I said, gloves, glacial lake outburst floods, often they happen with lakes that are on the surface. Sometimes they happen with lakes that are inside the ice. And this is a bit scary for anyone. It's scary also for people working with remote sensing, because you can imagine it's very hard to see them. Sometimes basically you cannot see them. This is an example where we have a lot of water coming out from inside a glacier. These cases have been documented, especially in Switzerland and um, and and in France. Um, and it's basically, you have a big pocket of water uh, that is suddenly draining outside of the glacier. We, we can hardly prepare for it. Um, to give you, and an idea of dimension. So the first one that was properly documented is in, is in France. It's a very old photograph from 1892 um, uh, on Petrus in the Mont Blanc area, where suddenly this big chunk of ice disappeared. And you see two people standing next to it, just to give you an idea of, um, of dimension, right? So this whole hole wasn't there before, and suddenly a hole formed in the ice. I think you can imagine if you stand there, this would be very scary if you actually experienced this. In this case, many, many people died in the downstream. Um, and there is research going on until today to try to understand what is actually happened, what has happened inside the ice. 
Uh, on the right, you see a contemporary example from high mountain Asia. This is on the border between China and Nepal. Um, you can see from top, so from a, an optical image, how one of these lakes has actually caved in. So you have a glacier here, and somewhere in the middle of the glacier, suddenly the whole glacier has caved in, which gives us an indication that it was kind of a pocket in, below the ice, and it started to it started to collapse. So the, the the roof that was on top of that pocket started to collapse. Now. There is interest in there's a big research project in Switzerland at the moment as well, trying to understand this better. We are not at all prepared for this. We suspect this happens probably much more often in future in, uh, in high mountain Asia as well. And you know, I think this is something for penetrating kind of uh, for penetrating pot potential of radar, uh, sorry, of, of remote sensing to to think about what could we actually do to anticipate these kind of assets um, in in future. This is just one example that you know. We are we are we are looking at some of the well established hazards uh, now, but we should be prepared that things may develop. Should be you know um, should be prepared for things changing so fast that we can't just sit around and, and look at the, the standard hazards uh, because it's 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 happening so fast already. Glacier detachments. This is a, a, a these are well documented cases by now in uh, in the Tibetan plateau where really whole chunks of um, um, glaciers suddenly. Started to disintegrate and 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 flow down the mountain, right? So this is uh, very peculiar cases that don't happen very often, um, that have not caused a lot of fatalities uh, so far, luckily. Um, but if this happens more often, of course, this is this is very very worrying, and we suspect that climate change does play some role in it. Um, now, I mentioned with all these hazards, I mentioned before the term needle in the haystack, and this is an example of a of, a, of an ice avalanche that hit the lake only uh, very uh, recently, about a month ago, um, less than a month ago in, in Nepal. Uh, so, so there, there was a so just bear with me with the picture here. So this is a CubeSat image, a planet image of a, of a lake in Nepal, um, and, and basically the lower chunk of a glacier. So you have a glacier flowing down here into a lake. A lower, lower chunk of a glacier broke off and, and dropped as an avalanche into the lake that that caused a, a spillway. Uh, out of the lake, it, 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 this, this was an image taken by by Planet by a CubeSat of a of a, of a lake in, in in Nepal where a chunk of ice broke off, and that ice dropped into in, into a lake and caused a spillway that that, that, that caused a tsunami a small tsunami wave outside of the lake. Luckily, nobody was killed, but um, this. We did not, nobody anticipated this to happen. This has happened before, and this, this lake was classified as potentially dangerous in the past already. But then it was considered not dangerous enough anymore because we also cannot look at all the lakes all the time. Um, and now something has happened again. Now, the, the question is a bit for us, you know, where should we keep looking for the next event to happen? Now, this has happened at this specific lake. We could now start doing very specific studies on this specific lake. But then probably in three months it will happen somewhere. Else. Um, and this is actually to give you an example um, of an event that happened last October in India, South Lonak, where more than 100 people died. Uh, it was just about to the early warning system was just about to be installed, uh, and 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 we already anticipated that this was a dangerous lake, um, and it showed us again the potential potential challenge of, of glacial lake outburst floods. But now we are all focusing perhaps a bit, you know, on this one lake. The next big disaster is probably going to happen and one of the other hundreds of them around. So how, how are we ready to, I mean, we, we can all start a, a study, a specific studies on this one feature, um, but kind of the hazard is going to say, well, uh, aha, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, so, so this is this is a huge challenge to be kind of in terms of preparedness, right? With um, also for remote sensing. So, how can remote sensing anticipate? Uh, we have tried to do this in in other big events, in Chamoli, for example, um, showing that it's very very hard to, to anticipate pre movement of such kind of events. And even if we could track it, it would be so much data that we have to make sense of all this data. So, uh, this. This makes it, yeah. This makes it very, very hard, and sometimes a wicked problem in a way that I feel like, okay, we, you know, we shouldn't give up. But sometimes feels like it's, it's, it's overwhelming. 
Um, but to give you an example of, um, of, of, of how this is tackled, I just mentioned the Chamoli event. Perhaps some of you have heard about that. That was a big, um, big rock ice avalanche that happened in India in 2021, where we very rapidly, really hours after the event happened, we, we, it was on a Sunday, happened in the morning, but a few hours already afterwards, we were sourcing images, trying to figure out what had happened. And basically by the evening, we, we had traced it down to, to, um, um, to, to kind of a source. And then a huge group of scientists across the world um, went, um, you know, sat together with all kinds of remote sensing data sets, tried to piece uh, the process together and also with modeling. Uh, so this this showed the potential of the scientific community, you know, coming together on these kind of assets with different capacities, try to try to find that needle in the haystack in the future, um, perhaps. Uh, but then, of course, yeah, the, the question is a bit uh, uh, then for that, that I had during the process of that paper as well is you know um, what's the point of publishing this as a scientific paper, right? How much of that gets is is, is stuck in terms of or or, or sticks in terms of a uh, response in future? How how, how does it make us more prepared in future? Um, and and in this case, luckily, I think it brought the topic of permafrost on, on the political landscape in the region as well. After this and after another event in Nepal, suddenly everyone was talking about monitoring these kind of head walls and if they start to crack, we should do something about it. Easier said than done. But these kind of big scientific papers that create a lot of attention in the media, they have that feature then as well that they, 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 they get the attention that then politics also has to follow suit. It doesn't always materialize into actual responses. Um, sometimes then we forget about it again and something else takes over, unfortunately. But um, they do have, so, you know, sometimes purely writing these academic papers, apart from us doing research, and that's our mandate, of course, it, it does stick in terms of um, what it then does for, for actual response in, in, in the countries as well. It, it definitely happened in this case. And I'm going to stop now here on, on with, with this on, the hazards and risks and, and, and move to the other parts, not to go too much over time. Um, a really important point, the huge challenge are the, the multi-hazards that it's not just one of these events happening, but it's many of them happening at the same time, right? So this was a big, a big event in Nepal, in Melamchi, where we had a lake that was breaching. Um, we had instability of slopes, landslides, everything happened more or less at the same time. And, and, and then tracing that, you have to know different types of products, remote sensing, um, to be able to really make that work. Uh, so that that becomes scary as well, and that's a bit the future. There's a multi-hazard perspective, not just looking at one type of hazard. You have to be prepared that that all of them will happen in unison to some degree. Um, now, very very important is is then the the exposure part, of course, for risks as well, um, which is uh, you know that that tracking tracking where people live, where infrastructure is. And and here I think it's very important for for high mountain Asia again that many of the glo the challenge of these global data sets and I just want to give you an an, an example here um, of a same location in Nepal two different data sets both of those data sets are very valuable but they have the challenges when being applied in this high mountain um, region right so there is this Klimara global data set which is based on nightlight sensitivity so intensity which is really useful to get an an, an idea of um, of the value of infrastructure on a global scale. Um, it's being developed in Switzerland um, for a valley in Nepal, which, which I know very well where we work in. And then this is high resolution um, data of settlements. Um, so the, the, the yellow dots that you see up here are population density for that same valley, right? Produced with optical, optical data, um, specifically in this location. And what you can see here is the nightlight intensity has a huge issue in mountains because it basically says that all the infrastructure is up in the mountains. So these are the this what is white here are the glaciers and the snow because of course there's some reflection from the snow and the ice. Um, where I know very well there is no infrastructure, right? So so these these um, these relatively coarse products they are they have a lot of merit on the large scale, but they have their challenges on the smaller scale. So we really have to think about higher resolution products that are being that are that are true for these very complex topographic landscapes, especially in mountains, if we want to be responsive for these individual events that are happening in mountains. So there is a huge potential for remote sensing in that, in that direction in mountain areas that I think we should invest in more. And just to, you know, this is this is population distribution around high mountain Asia. 
we often simply don't know how many people live in the area. I can tell you so many discussions that we had at ECMOD. The, the, the population data, even for these mountain regions, is still pretty poor. And perhaps sometimes people imagine, well, we just have to look at the global data sets. It's not that easy. Um, so we have to invest a lot more to try to even understand where the people in the region are. Now I'm going to, uh, I, I talked about this part already, right? The resources, you, you saw now a couple of products and um, I'm not going to talk about this uh, so much here because I want to close uh, with the capacities, which I think is an important point. Um, this is just to to, to highlight that, that we are, um, in terms of resources, we are looking at in situ monitoring. This is a map from our high risk project where, where you have um, the, the infrastructure in, in situ monitoring and high mountain Asia, there is, there is ample of it, right? Uh, the question is, how is this being matched with remote sensing data? Um, and of course, there is there is a lot of remote sensing data. And, and perhaps here, the, the, the last part is, is most important. I think there is a lot of homegrown solutions that are being developed in the region, right? So China has their own space program. India has their own space program that produces interesting, um, very interesting data coming out. Um, but there is still a challenge in terms of accessing these new products. Um, so we often, as scientists, we still rely on the international products that are coming out from outside the region. But I, there are also examples how this is actually progressing quite uh, so, so some of the local solutions are progressing and being integrated into risk management. I'm not going to talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, that's, uh, that's an, an interesting topic in itself, but it's, it's going to be another challenge. I'm going, I want to close here with uh, the capacities. I see I'm already running a bit over time, and Adnan, you have to really cut me off. It's, it's, it's getting too much, but... Um, uh, uh, I, I think you have, you have time. Okay, uh, okay, great. Uh, take Easily take about eight to ten minutes. I think it should be. Yeah, yeah perfect. No, it's it's not going to take more than that. No, it's uh, I'm I, I just really want to you know I think capacities. This is perhaps the least technical part, and it's the least directly relevant to this community as well. But in the end, it's about us. Well, there are, I see now there are seventy participants. Very happy about, and it's about us as people working to make this work. And and the remote. If we are honest about it. You know, the, the, the many of the remote sensing, and this is more, at least my, my experience, many of the remote sensing solutions that we have here in the region, but also elsewhere, they don't fail because of the resolution or the technical aspect. They fail because we don't have the right people at the right time to apply them in the right way. So um, being prepared for that, I think, if we if we want to make it work for, for a, a proper response, so, then, then, then this is crucial. So this is why I think capacity design. Um, so to give you an overview in the region, uh, so I think that, you know, universities in the region are really pushing the state, the art, remote sensing, um, to application as well, right? So this is just a couple of examples. Uh, so there, there are, I, I put here the number of academic institutions that I know of that are doing excellent work in terms of, you know, cutting edge remote sensing in the region. Um, there are at least. There are at least two in, in Pakistan. There are at least two, um, so big institutes, there are different, many, many groups, of course, but um, big institutes that are, you know, ahead of already anticipating what's going to be the new stuff, um, at least two in India and, and at least three in China. So the capacities are there. And then there are many other smaller groups around. Um, the challenges that I listed here a bit is just for the, you know, I don't want to put the countries on the spot, but um, to, to give you a bit of an example. Um, in, in, in Pakistan, we do have the, there's the economic situation, which is impacting academia as well a lot. So you have a big brain drain. And the biggest challenge that I see here working is there is a lack of cooperation between um, government and, acad and academia, right? Which is something that we really would have to invest in more um, to overcome, to make the solution that are being produced in academia useful for government. In India, this is, this is also a challenge. Um, there is a lot of science being produced. Sometimes I cannot see, uh, you know, the wood anymore from from the trees because it's so much. And uh, so this, 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 there is a lot of this criticism as well of this, you know, turbo publishing um, that, that 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 doctor, you know, asking the kind of asking the next critical question and focusing on something new um, is perhaps the that I see as as, as 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 the next challenge there, especially because the capacities are there and even their own products are there. In in work, working um, uh, with with uh, with colleagues in China, which which has you know 
there has been a lot more exchange in the region as well, also with Chinese colleagues um, in within within the country and with other countries. Is still a bit um, is the sharing, which is not. It also has a lot to do with language challenges between the different countries. Um, and then there are other countries that that have excellent capacities, but the infrastructure for these capacities are have, are lacking or have been. Like in Afghanistan, for example, they just have been decreasing. So it has been very challenging for people to actually stay in the country and keep doing something for it. Um, but I also want to put the focus on that there are non-academic stakeholders using remote sensing and developing remote sensing in, in hazard response. Right? So it's not just the universities. There are professional organizations in the region as well um, that, are, that, are really, that are really doing excellent work. And I just want to give you here an example from an organization that works in the region. Um, in, in, in a couple of countries. Um, so that's the Aga Khan, uh, Aga Khan agency for which we are providing many of these um, products as well when they need them, but they already have their own capacities as well to, to actually use this. Um, so, you know, they, they themselves are investing in radar capacities um, and they're working on the ground in these mountain regions to actually apply this. Um, so there's a lot of potential to actually make the remote sensing um, remote sensing material available, not just for universities, but for uh, agencies that are working directly in the mountain. Um, and because they are the ones who then produce these kind of hazard maps, they are producing um, the direct response to a single village if something is happening. They are the ones who can anticipate a bit the needle in the haystack rather than us who sit still very, very far away from the problem. Uh, so I think this is, you know, being aware of these capacities, they are there. Um, they they are happy. They engage a lot with us. They want to learn about um, about the solutions that are around. Um, there is a lot of potential to engage with them as well. Um, so not just people working at university. Uh, and they also they invest a lot in in their own infrastructure in terms of you know they have their own databases collecting all this data. They they uh, because they are on the ground. They also understand. And I was talking about weird hazards that we don't do not know about yet. I'm, I'm really sorry for, for that. Um, so it, the last point before we then, well, I hope we can go into a discussion is, uh, of course, also want to highlight that there are government agencies around that, that have capacities and that we are that we are working closely with and that, that are, are, you know, are investing in, in those research resources that we are working with. I, I said here we have three or two and a half space nations in the region. So the three countries do have a space program. Um, I say two and a half because the one in, in, in Pakistan is, 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 is lagging a bit behind the other two, right, in terms of also the, the capacities, in terms of material, what is there. Um, the big question, the big challenge here is, is really to, um, in, in terms of these, these mountain risks, what is relevant to look for in all this data again, right, just sending more satellites into space is not going to do it. Um, and uh, so, so, so this is this is going to be an, ex in, an an important challenge, also in anticipating what kind of satellites to produce for the future, um, and what kind of products to produce for the future to send up into space, um, and and then you know what kind of hazards will be relevant five years down the line with rapidly changing um, uh, climate, and and then finally, I think there needs to be a lot of investment in this improved collaboration between government and academia in the region because we really want to make sure that that the solutions that are coming out from the smart guys who sit in different agencies or in different universities it can be streamlined whatever solutions um, um, are coming up can be streamlined directly and can be can be made useful for, for rapid response because academics are often not the best. I mean, we sit in offices in front of our screens as well. And we are not the best to make the decisions in the field. Right? Um, but to give you an example of, you know, I, I mentioned the South Lona glacial outburst last year, and these are images from the Indian satellite, um, which is 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 a, is a great product. They, they these 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 satellites are already tasked to look at specifically look at dangerous lakes that have been identified before as potentially dangerous. And are constantly monitoring them, and and um, you can see even here how the lake has been changing. In this case, a lot of material that dropped inside the lake and caused the flood, which, as I said before, caused many many deaths. So there was already there was anticipation. This was informed by academia, also by Indian academia, that there is a challenge. We should look at those lakes, right? And then government did invest in those resources, 
and I did not steal these images. They were made public, right? So this is this is, this is public material. They, they, they were probably, of course, publishing this as well, that they are able to respond to this kind of issue, which just shows um, also also a country that, of course, um, there, is, there are things being developed that are, that are useful. And as you can see here, this is being compared to the Sentinel satellites. So two images before and after from the Indian satellite and in between the Sentinel and 1A. Um, so it, this, 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 the development of these satellites in, was, was, was informed by capacities coming from the region in collaboration with uh, international scientists. And, um, and it's being made, you know, it's being made useful for, for responses. This is to say there is a lot of, you know, I think there's a lot of hope to, to integrate the up and coming solutions in remote sensing in the region um, with these caveats being prepared for what is coming next and not expecting that the hazards will stay the way they are um, and not expecting that exposure will stay the way it is because it's changing so fast that we, we should try to be ahead of the game um, as, as much as possible. Uh, I think that's that's it. This is uh, the last two slides is really just the working groups that we have under HSC where we're working on these issues on high mountain data. Um, where I welcome you to you know check out uh, Himalayan University Consortium. We do a lot of networking in the region. And we have a dedicated program on, on risk data in the region. That's highrisk.org using the link at the bottom. It's pretty easy, I think, easy to remember where we are working in the region on exchanging capacities and, and responding to risks in high mountain Asia, including remote sensing. I mean, I'm happy to exchange beyond this webinar as well. Um, that was it. I'm really, really sorry for the connectivity issues. Uh, I, I'm happy that I made it back. It has happened before already that I did not manage to come back. I'm open for questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Jakub, for for this very interesting talk. And uh, connection breaks, uh, they, they happen, so it's completely okay. And I'm very grateful to all the participants who, who stayed till the end. Uh, and I think now we can proceed with the Q&A. Um, so again, to all the participants, if you have any question, please just write it in the chat box and then uh, I, I can read it out and direct it to our speaker. Uh, so well, should we proceed, uh, Irena? And uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so what are the questions we have in the chat box for, for uh, Jakub? What is your opinion about properly employing big data analytics? We as Earth environmental scientists may not be at ease when dealing with tera or petabytes of data, but computer scientists usually are. Should we collaborate more enthusiastically with computer scientists to achieve automation in monitoring these risks? In your opinion, how helpful would that be? Hi, hi, Omar. Uh, great question. Hope you're doing fine. Thanks for joining. Uh, well, I, I, I don't want to drop, uh, you know, interdisciplinarity just like that, but basically did that already. Yes, of course, absolutely crucial. I, um, you, you know, my, my computer is has been overheating the whole day today with, uh, with big data, data sets that remote sensing data from Greenland that, that I know what it means, but I, I don't know how to most efficiently process it. And, 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 and I know that there are folks out there who do know that. Um, and that's what I was, I was alluding to that at one point as well, when I work with scientists, younger scientists and me here in the region as well, who, who are much more proficient in big data processing. Uh, and I, I enjoy collaborating with them. And I was perhaps a bit, you know, I was jumping over the artificial intelligence slide, um, but I think that's going to be a big issue as well, because that basically also deals to some degree with it, right? Dealing with all this big data, we can do that with artificial intelligence. I think, well, we, we have we have dropped into that age um, already, uh, and we see that in the region uh, as well. I'm... Um, I'm I'm not so proficient with that. Uh, I'm I already feel old when I try to caution some of the the, the young scientists here who are working with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, who are able to churn out a lot of data and process it very quickly, and you know try to go one step back and say, okay, but we still have to critically reflect. What does that still then actually mean, right? If we too fast, if we especially about I had a discussion this morning with a colleague. If we throw um, all this data created 
buy machines um, or all this data from somewhere else on a data scarce region, we may run into the re may run into the risk of overriding um, issues or you know uh, being misinformed or being informed by by processes that are different elsewhere uh, for the region here, and we cannot really check whether it's applicable here. Uh, so I think yes, we have to we have to collaborate a lot more uh, with uh, with those able to process these large amounts of data, especially in regions that are so large. Um, because I cannot deal, I, 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 I cannot see the issues anymore because there's so much going on and there's so many data sets around. Um, but I think um, it, it holds a lot of potential for collaboration because there is the merit for those, you know, uh, being critical of the local issues here and there that you should uh, keep in mind uh, uh, when using the big data sets. Uh, so, so seeing them, see, seeing those big data sets critically, uh, while being aware that we have to be able to upscale very, very quickly. So, the the one example, for example, from these single lakes that I can give you is sometimes that people like me would say, "Oh, we have to investigate this one lake in all its detail to understand the process exactly." Right. So, if you do this. We sit here in 10 years and then we have understood that one lake perhaps, but in that meantime, 50 other lakes will have breached and they will have caused a lot more problems. So yes, we have to sometimes get away from this nitty gritty, small data, you know, point scale data problem and very quickly, um, you know, uh, upscale. Uh, and, and that we can only do with people who are able to, to handle large data sets. Um, so I think, yes, absolutely. And for that, we need more collaboration across disciplines. Uh, thank you, Jakob. We have actually four questions in the queue and a little bit short of time. So I'll jump immediately to the next question from Manish Kumar. In Himalayan region, most of the satellite images contain mixed pixels of built up and forest. Is there any method to unmix these mixed pixels to correctly classify land use land cover? There are, I mean, this is this, uh, this goes into details that are that are a bit um too much for you know happy to, uh, uh, to 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 discuss this outside of the webinar. There are methods. There are very very exciting methods. I did one exa one one example for example is a, a recent study um, by colleagues from I think it was Yale who looked into subpixel um, uh, subpixel uh, infrastructure data uh, with Landsat images uh, who do this kind of unmixing uh and and then are able to 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 look at uh, um, infrastructure land cover in all over the Himalayan arc actually uh with traditional Landsat data fantastic work yes there is um it's it's non-trivial and uh you you need to know your uh your well you need to know you, you need to have the background for it um but uh, there have been a lot of exciting papers especially in the last three years on with applications, especially in the region, that you can read up on that are accessible. Absolutely. Happy to share them if you can. Right. Uh, Basanta Raj Adhikari is asking, can you please share your opinion how we can investigate cascading and compounding hazards in high mountain Asia? Any methodological development? <laughs> Basanta, you are asking me that. You know that much better than me. But um, that, that you know, I think... The methodological development is that that that, that people like, like you and many of you probably here as well across the region who know different processes and different products as well um, sit put their heads together and 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 try to try to mix it rather than unmixing from what we said before try to mix those skills um, because uh, at the moment we we like just with one satellite product. We, we we don't seem to be be able to, to to capture those right we uh uh we we need to be able to see outside of the box if you just work with sentinel look at something else if you just work with Landsat, look at something else um i think you know being aware of the developments that are happening in the satellite domain and and their different potentials is going to get us closer to that when we're talking about remote sensing right um in general also it needs other disciplines completely outside of remote sensing. but i think Having a better understanding across the board of what the different products can actually do and where their strengths and weaknesses are, kind of for us as a community, and who the right people are for each product to respond to would help us a lot in having a better multi hazard. Uh, yeah. 
you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so, question from Diego Antonio Garcia Tadio: What is the difference between high mountain Asia and glaciers in Andes? Uh, separate webinar, I would say, uh, is, 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 is a, a, a lot of, a lot of differences, but even within high mountain Asia, we have regions where, where the responses to climate, even of glaciers are, are quite, quite different. I think the biggest difference probably is, is then the, the Andes, um, especially in Patagonia, of course, you have connections of glaciers to the ocean, um, and to much lower areas than you have in high mountain Asia. So generally in high mountain Asia, we are, we are talking about elevations that are, that are much, much higher, which brings you into environments that are colder and the changes there are very different. So I think this is probably compared to the Andes is the biggest, biggest one. Um, and it's, it's wetter here. The most part. Okay, uh, so given the rising temperatures, will the frequency and magnitude of GLOF events increase or decrease in HMA and other mountain regions? How to better manage risks of multi-hazards and reduce exposure and vulnerabilities of downstream communities, especially in resource-poor settings? Question from Alia Alia. Yeah, well, if I would have that, uh, that, that, that answer, I would uh, be publishing... Uh much higher impact papers every day. Uh, it's not so trivial. Uh, and I'm very cautious in in saying anything about increasing trends of, uh, of hazards, because for most of them, we either don't know, we don't see it yet. For gloves, we don't see an increasing trend as far as we know so far. That doesn't mean that they are not a problem, right? I think we, we, should, we, we should acknowledge that for many communities, they don't even, they, they don't, they are bad enough, even if the the trend on the long and the, the long range is not increasing. It's it's bad enough as it is. Um, for for some hazards, and it it varies very much across the region, which is a very annoying scientist scientist answer, especially for journalists saying, well, it depends on where you look at. But high mountain Asia is so big that we do we do see different trends for different hazards in different parts of high mountain Asia, and I think this is also important for us to. To, to acknowledge though, because climate of course also varies quite a lot. We have very dry parts, we have very wet parts, and then of course also the hazards hazards change. The change of climate is different in different parts of high mountain Asia. Again, this brings us perhaps back to what Omar was mentioning before. We we need big data sets to to make sense of it all, and we need someone who can process these big data sets because uh, just a few weather stations are not going to do that definitely because it's so variable. And the same is true for multi hazard response then. Yeah, so Irena, uh, you... I have also a question, if you may. <laughs> I, I found it very interesting. Thanks again for, for this very interesting and uh, inspiring also presentation. Uh, in, your, in your last slide, you have uh, mentioned some things that still needs to be resolved. Who is doing this and when do you expect some answers to the question that you may had? Uh, you mean, especially when it comes to... Uh... To, okay, so that yeah, the, well, I can share this here again. The the, mm -hmm. the questions I put there were, um, uh, what is relevant to look for, right? Uh, yes. And, well, th this is it, it. This depends, of course, which discipline you ask. And if you ask someone who has been interested in glacial lake outburst floods, they will look into glacial lake outburst floods. But I think for this, we need a lot more collaboration with uh, with those people working in the downstream, with people working with communities, for example, also with social scientists who better know what people actually care about. Right? This goes into a very different domain as well in, in asking communities what they worry about. Um, because often we have not, and that includes me, we have not been doing that enough. We, we did not ask people first what they care about. We came as scientists and said, this is exciting. We have this data set, let's use it. Um, this uh, the, the, the working together with communities in these high mountain areas, I think, is going to lead us to the to narrowing down what is relevant. If we, I mean, we if we want to work on topics that are relevant for the people living there, we can of course also look at processes, for example, that do not affect people at all because they happen so far away from many communities. They may still be interesting for process understanding for a scientific from a scientific point of view, but in terms of risk management, they become less of an issue. So I think working together, like learning from communities, learning from local knowledge about what matters is is, is important. And there, there are initiatives in the region that are doing that. So we do see a lot more, well, more than zero. We, there, there was an increase in, in, in understanding that there needs to be more 
we need to ask first and come with answers later, right? Rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what hazards will be relevant five years down the line is 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 really really hard to say. And and to give you you know back to that example that I gave, that's just one of them, right? These lakes that are forming inside the ice. Um, I think. There, it has helped me a lot to talk to scientists from other regions, be they from the Andes, from the Rockies, from the Alps, because with the with those water pockets from, for example, I learned that it was a bigger issue in the Alps already. So we can we can learn what has been developed elsewhere and apply it here. Perhaps for high mountain Asia, we can learn from something here, right? Glacier detachments, for example, and apply that somewhere else. Um, so this is why it's so important for academia in the region also of course, to keep collaborating on an international stage because many of these processes, they, they do happen some way or other, perhaps they already happen somewhere else, um, or perhaps some of the processes that happen here will happen somewhere else. So I think on being in exchange on that is, is important and um, that that. Yeah, and understanding where exposure will, of course, matter because that will also tell us where which assets will be more relevant for community. And the okay, last yeah. one, well, that's... Yeah, no, I think the, these are the main questions that I had, especially, I mean, it would be very interesting to know, right, what are the five, what are the really relevant parameters in five years or what would be the hazards that we are expecting? I think this is something that is uh, very important also for the remote sensing people, right, to look to 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 really develop methods and to look to them and to monitor these effects. I, I think in in working with remote sensing, this is the most exciting actually that you know working with what we already have is exciting enough, of course. There's so much data around to constantly look for you know what what, what is happening in the present. But yeah, thinking about I mean what some of the space agencies are doing already, right? Developing developing tools that that are that are hopefully mapping the next five or ten years something that 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 will be interesting. Um, this this will be this will be crucial. But again, I think there it will be important to work with people who understand the processes on the ground and perhaps who don't understand remote sensing at all, and and to listen to them uh, and try to like get out from them a bit. Okay, what of that would be possible to see from space? What isn't? Some of that may not be. Um, which requires, again, going back to what Omar mentioned at the very beginning, requires a lot more um, collaboration between disciplines, but also academia, outside of academia, government, for example. I know many government and agents and even local farmers here who know problems already much longer than we as an academic community are, are, are realizing that they are an issue, right? And, and, they, and, and I even had these cases where I talk to community members and they look at me and go like, well, you, you don't have to tell me. And I know this already that you were not even born then. Why why are you coming with your PhD and, and trying to educate me about it? You you should have come up with a solution 10 years ago. And and I think if we uh, so so there is a lot of potential to to learn from them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have more questions coming up, but we are way past 8 p.m. already. So I'm a bit uh, skeptic now whether should be should we close or uh, we can take maybe just one last question quickly and would really appreciate a, a short answer to that. How can we utilize remote sensing to study sediment transportation? Do you think there is any specific data for this issue? Question. Um, from... so it's it's hard to give a short answer on that. I can tell you there there, there is there is a lot. Is I mean. There are different products. There is exciting stuff going on, even um, even with uh, you know Landsat legacy products. There is exciting potential of of of, of Sentinel. Um, that there has been very nice work after the Chamoli event, for example, in India, um, where you could trace the sediment film all the way down to Delhi. Um, so there, with different products across the region. It's a developing, I know PhD students working on that right now, trying to develop products in that direction, more refining that. I think the exciting point here will be combining that with field measurements, which is hard enough to do, measuring sediments in water. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a frontier topic, really. A uh, very, very important one for hazards, for hydropower, for agriculture, for you know fertility of land. Um, if that's something that you find is exciting, do it. Uh, it's 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 not something where there is a off the shelf solution that you can download and and have a nice map across the region or anywhere really. 
Um, but uh, it's it's definitely something that is possible with some of the products that are around already. Uh, and seeing that, sorry, Arnaud, the time is running out. I mean, if you remember my name, you know where to find me, and I'm happy to keep answering your questions if you want. So I'm really sorry again for the connectivity issues, which just now. Uh, okay. Uh, th uh, thank you. Thank you. With this, I would like to close today's session. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Jakob Steiner for giving us his time. And I'm also very, very grateful to the participants uh, for joining today's webinar. So I wish you all uh, a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.